Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> Obesity is rampant. It's not just here in the United States. Anywhere where there's American food, there's obesity around the world. You talked also about B vitamins in particular. Methylation needs mm -hmm. magnesium for the B vitamins to work. Can you explain that process to us? Well, I, I started to look into methylation around the autism, ADHD community where it seemed like these kids uh, had trouble methylating their B vitamins, which, which meant they weren't able to do certain things like uh, digesting the protein in um, milk and in um, casein and in gluten, the gluten protein. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult process to explain, but basically the, um, if you're not methylating, it can be because you don't have enough magnesium. And I don't have any, any um, scientific proof, but I know as soon as I give um, autistic or ADHD kids magnesium in some form, they start doing better on all levels. So I just assume that one of the things that magnesium doing is, is doing is helping the methylation process. Which helps with obesity, correct? Well, yes. The, with the um, B vitamins, um, along with magnesium, they help digest the, the basic food groups. So it's, um, I think the, the obesity and B vitamins, I, I had this very interesting uh, uh, paper that I read where uh, a certain obesity gene in rats they found that if they gave the genes with the obesity, if they gave the rats with the obesity gene enough B vitamins, then they did not express their obesity. How interesting. Right. So, there, I mean, there's so much. It's called epigenetics where people think it's all about the genes, but it's actually about the vitamins and minerals that turn on or off the various genes. Can you talk a little bit about alcoholism? Because many, many people drink, even if they have two drinks a day. It doesn't mean they're an alcoholic necessarily, but there is a lot of drinking around the world. And what is the correlation that may be happening? Is this the missing mineral that may be impressing the person to drink on a biochemical level? What do you think? Well, that's what some early research um, in France uh, was looking at, that a major cause of alcoholism is magnesium deficiency. And I couldn't find much more on that. What, the American research on alcoholism is if, um, if a person can be treated with magnesium, if they've had a brain injury and they've been drinking, it, it helps to heal the brain. But um, what we know about alcoholism is that um, it's a disease and to my mind, it's a deficiency of various vitamins and minerals where uh, maybe a person just isn't getting enough nutrients and feels a, a lack or feels a craving that alcohol seems to either f fill, fills that craving or numbs that craving. But um, what I find is if um, I can get someone who wants to be treated for their their craving for alcohol and put them on the methylated B vitamins, vitamin C and magnesium, even just those three and vitamin, yeah, vitamin C, the B vitamins and magnesium, then they start to lose their craving. How interesting. I want to ask you about testing. I've never heard of magnesium testing, deficiency testing. Talk a little bit about it. Talk about what we have available to us now that you're aware of. Well, that, that is um, such a problem because only 1% of the body's total uh, amount of magnesium is in the bloodstream. So if you, you know, put your dipstick for magnesium in the bloodstream, you're not really going to get an accurate portrayal. And um, the blood itself, because it perfuses the heart and keeps the heart muscle functioning, then if there's um, not enough magnesium in the bloodstream, the feedback mechanisms from the body will just pull some out of the, the bones or the muscles. So it always keeps the blood looking pretty normal. 
So most of the blood tests that doctors do from the bloodstream look okay. So I think it got to a point where doctors just don't bother testing it because when you look at a standard chem screen, you'll, you'll see sodium, potassium, calcium, but you won't see magnesium. And what, what I've been recommending is for people to get either a red blood cell magnesium test where maybe 40% of the body's magnesium is found in the cell, so the red blood cell can give you more accurate description, or there's an EXA test, E-X-A, T-E-S-T, which is a scraping from the inside of the mouth where uh, under an electron microscope, they look at these stained cells and see the, the mineral content of the cells. So it's, it's still not as accurate as um, what the research labs have been using, which is an ionic uh, ion test of, uh, of magnesium. Right now, actually, I'm working with some people to, to try to encourage them to do more of the, these ionized magnesium tests because I think if, um, if you ran an experiment where in people who had magnesium deficiency, you ran their, their serum test, their red blood cell test, and their ionic magnesium test, you'd find a great discrepancy. Do you think that we'll be able to take those tests in the next year? I, I would hope so, but uh, the test, um, Burton and Bella Altura, the, um, the doctors that wrote the foreword to my book, they actually um, worked with this, uh, this test, and uh, I thought it was no longer available, but I, I just found from uh, a PhD who wrote to me asking about the test, we found that the, the machinery is still available and we're just looking for places now to, to use the machine and start running this ionized magnesium test. You're on the board of the Gersten Institute, right? Yes, that's right. They do some fabulous work too. When I went to your website, I noticed in the blog that you're introducing coffee enemas and I just thought it would be interesting to have you share where you stand about that. Yes, it, it was a big leap for me to talk about that because, you know, the, in, in North America, we have such a bias to, to sticking anything in those orifices, but <laughs> it was, um, it was a modality that was used by Dr. Max Gerson you know, back in the, the early 1900s in his, his treatment of cancer. And he found it one of the, the great detoxifiers. Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez uses it, and he's getting the best um, treatment rate for pancreatic cancer. And when I've um, been at the Gerson uh, Institute in San Diego, I went through their program and, and did my coffee enemas, and I found them you know, very easy to do and, and a great way, an external, uh, quote-unquote, way to detoxify because otherwise... You're, you're taking a lot of pills or you're doing a, a lot of juices or you're taking things that maybe you can't quite digest to detoxify. And for a lot of people, especially the clients that I deal with, they do need things that, uh, like the clay baths and the magnesium baths, they need external ways to detoxify because they're, it's almost like they're too toxic to take anything more by mouth. That's a good point. Dr. Gonzalez said he takes two coffee enemas a day. We had him on twice. He's a riot. He's fascinating, too. Yeah. <laughs> but do you take two or do you take one a No, day? no, I'll just take one uh, a few times a week. And how do you feel after you do it? I just feel great. I feel light. It's, it's never interrupted my normal bob movement, so I'll have a normal bob movement the next morning. It, I think it just sort of... Uh, it. Um, I don't know that it speeds up your metabolic processes, but it normalizes them. And um, what I find is that the liver, which has to detoxify everything you put in it, everything you breathe, everything you drink, I think it takes, um, it helps take the pressure off the liver. It helps kind of pull out the bile and therefore making bile production a lot uh, more efficient because um, 
what happens with bile is that it's re- reabsorbed countless times back to the liver, and if it's if